Hey, everybody, and welcome back. Today on Retro Tech, we're going to be walking through a lot more recapping of the Sony BVM D24 E1WU. Again, very high end Sony CRT professional monitor. This particular one came from a television studio, which I discussed briefly before, but it was part of a load of three of them. Today's monitor has over 68,000 uh, total hours on the chassis and the whole monitor itself. And I can tell from inspection that it has the original capacitors inside all the boards. Now, prior to this, we've recapped the PA board, and today we're going to specifically look at the other uh, cluster of boards on the back, on the right-hand side of the screen over here. That is our group of kind of power supply boards. And the first one we're going to work on is the G board, which is the ex the power supply board for this monitor, the main one. The PA board we recap prior did uh, does do some power functions, but this is the main power board. And the good thing about servicing these boards is they do not have to be, uh, you know, you don't have to discharge the monitor, actually even take it apart really to get the cards out and service them. So you, there's no real reason you should have to discharge this BVM if you wanted to get a card serviced. And the good thing about that is, is you could always buy a replacement card if something happened to your power board or if you had a malfunction on one of the other boards, you could buy a replacement, slip in your new replacement board and slip out your other board and just either get rid of it, send it back to Sony, or you could try to repair it. Now today, again, I'm running through and recapping this one and it's gonna start with just removing all the old electrolytic capacitors. Uh, just so you know, this one was from like the 1999 area, 2000-ish, early 2000s is the manufacturer date on this monitor. So the main reason I wanted to pull these specific capacitors out of these boards is I really wanted to see uh, how this monitor breaks down over time. And this is a good time to do it because we're talking about a 20 year window here on these caps. And we want to take them all out and then uh, not just replace them with new caps, but I also want to actually take all the caps from these boards and I'm going to run some tests on them. I don't actually have, uh, you know, me running the tests. I've got a new meter here that is this little meter, and I may do some testing videos with it in the future. But what it will do is it will test the um, capacitance value, you know, in microfarads for these capacitors. So what I did was I removed all the capacitors, for example, first off from this G power supply board, and then I kept them, and then I hooked them all up to my little meter here, and I tested every capacitor to see what the capacitor health was 20 years and 68,000 hours later. And uh, I did that again for every single capacitor on this meter. It's a very nice meter. I'll talk about it again in the future. But uh, first off, on the G board, surprisingly, uh, you know, none, not a single one of the capacitors on this G board was out of tolerance. So the tolerance on these is 20%. For example, if you have a 1,000 microfarad capacitor, 20% tolerance allows you to go 20% up or down above that 1,000 microfarad number. So you could go up as high as 1,200, but generally speaking, most capacitors aren't going to go over spec a lot of times. More often than not, they're going to fall and start to degrade and, and go lower on that uh, spectrum. So you're most likely going to be seeing the 200 down on, for example, a 1000 microfarad capacitor. You could have it go down to 800. Now that's still technically right at the edge of spec, but that's an example. And then if you go any beyond 20%, then you are out of spec. And that's what uh, I was really trying to find out here is if any of these caps were out of spec or whatnot, and the G board, surprisingly, even with 68,000 hours, uh, did not have really any issues with the capacitors, at least not the electrolytics. And this one only has electrolytics through holes. And uh, so there's not a huge or really any benefit to just going in and replacing these capacitors if they have that much life left on them. Because honestly, uh, Sony, 
when they bought these capacitors originally, they had them, um, you know, they were able to get some of the best capacitors in the world, and they're, they're obviously high quality and still holding up, and they still could have, you know, uh, if, the, if the heat doesn't get up high enough in the capacitors and the seals don't break down, you could run them another 10 years and another 30 plus thousand hours most likely without any trouble. So again, even though I recapped this entire board, uh, this specific G board, and there weren't any capacitors wrong, it was a study worth doing, but it's quite interesting, I thought, that again, there's not um, a lot of loss as far as capacitance on these capacitors. And sometimes what you'll run into now, the trouble I will have, is it's very difficult to find the uh, perfect capacitor. Sony had the perfect capacitors in these originally. Think about it. They were able to get them. Well, now, unfortunately, due to uh, supply chain breakdowns over the last six months, we are having a lot more trouble getting the perfect capacitor replacement now, uh, at least as an in-stock kind of deal where... Sometimes you have to get on long waiting lists just to get the right capacitor, okay? So if you don't have to recap it, it's generally not the best idea to just go in and recap the G board because a lot of those capacitors are still good. The second board I worked on, just second in line right next to that, is the buff board. Now, the buff board also, uh, is it's not got really anything to do with the power uh, so much to say as it's it there is in the sub menu and I'll show it to you later on the when we're going through the menus on the menu breakdown video of the monitor that the buff board will control some different things on there for functionality uh, it appears to be like you know your cursors and a lot of uh, the things that are like your monitor settings I believe that's what it is I'm not 100% sure we'll make sure that's the case when we go through the manual and the settings themselves but some settings controlled, nothing major as far as something like uh, geometry, though. That's not got anything to do with the buff board. And there it is with all the capacitors out and all these new capacitors in. And this one had two types of capacitors on it. One was all 16 volt 100 microfarad and then just one 1,000 microfarad capacitor. But again, the same thing was with this buff board there was not a single capacitor bad on it. And that one didn't surprise me so much because there's not a lot of high heat components on the buff board itself. The buff board is not going to be subject to a lot of heat. The only heat it really gets is it gets a heat from both the deflection board and then the power supply unit because it sits right in the middle of them. So it does get the heat from those two boards and that's pretty much the only heat exposure, but it's very well shielded. Uh, you saw me take that shielding off at the beginning. But just to make sure that there um, was nothing wrong with the capacitors on the buff board, again, just like the other board, I recapped it. I tested all the capacitors with the meter, and every one of these was well within tolerance. Outside of the one larger capacitor that you do see over here, that's the 6.3 volt, 1,000 microfarad capacitor. It dropped from 1,000 down to 813. So that is still within tolerance technically, and most likely you will definitely not see any performance issues with something like that on such a minor board and capacitor. But it is showing you that there is some wear out. That would be more of a time wear out most likely as compared to other elements of more heat and high ripple currents breaking it down. So there's that shielding I discussed with you as it put back on the outside of the board. It's on each side. Finally, the third board in line here. And you'll notice that I'm taking these boards out one at a time. I'm not actually taking one out and putting it back in. I'll put them all back in at the end. I'll show you that. Uh, but this is the third board in sequence. It's the deflection board or the E board. Please note that there is this one bunch of cables. There are two connectors over here that you saw me undo. One is the main connector, and then there is a ground cable connection. Again, lots of capacitors in this one. It had quite a few electrolytics, and this one did have a lot of heat sinks on it. And 
so this one I figured might have an opportunity to actually have some capacitor breakdown to the point where we may have actually needed to replace some of the capacitors in it. But uh, that and that was the case for this board. There were a few capacitors that were bad. I'll go through them again because, or not again in this video per se, but what I'm going to do is I'll have some information coming soon about the full cap kits that's going to be what I call the shotgun cap kit, which is just a minor cap kits of these capacitors that are failing or tending to fail from my study as opposed to all the 95% other of the capacitors that are not. So there's wound up being five capacitors that were failing on this. For my memory's sake, I remember they were 470 microfarad capacitors and they were dropping well over uh, 100 below 470, down into the uh, like 330, 320 range, which means they were falling straight out of spec and then eventually they may fail um, probably would have taken a lot more time, but again, those f two co capacitors were that four capacitors were like that, and then it was another 6.3 volt 1,000 microfarads that got down to um, below 800. So the funny thing is, is when I tracked where those capacitors are located, they're located right next to heat sinks. They're all in line with each other, so it really makes a lot more sense when you see that they're all um, together going to be, you know, affected, and then it makes sense why they're kind of wearing out, especially next to the heat cell, uh, source. So that's helpful information to know that they're, which capacitors are actually failing. And again, it, it just makes sense why they're failing. They're next to the hot points, and it's over time. It's well outside of the stated lifespan of the capacitor because you're talking about something with almost 70,000 hours of usage and um, they don't rate them that high normally. They only rate them, you know, based on 105 degrees Celsius or 85 degrees Celsius. But the problem a lot of people can get into is if you just go and change every capacitor like I did, you could actually get capacitors that um, you still get them within spec and they'll work fine and they'll work perfectly for, uh, you know, they could go 5, 10, 15,000 hours, but they won't last generally as long as those ones that. Sony specifically had designed uh, for this and they had bought originally, especially when they had parts availability. And a big company like Sony would have had first claim to any high-tech components. Uh, they could have uh, gone in and purchased any that they wanted and, and had priority over other uh, parts needers, I guess what you could say, but what I mean by someone that needs the parts, like someone just doing secondhand repair like me, for example. And so Sony would have had direct claim to the first stocks available. And I'm not even saying that there would have been a problem with components or getting components back then, because I don't know. But that's the situation we're in today, where it may actually be better off on a high-end monitor like the D32, the D24, and the D20. We're still in with this lifespan of these boards really being with intolerance, still most of the part. So if I pause it really quickly, I want to show you these capacitors I was mentioning. These two, right here where my cursor is, that's two of them. And I don't think I'll be able to show you the other side of it. But um, there's a heat sink up here. And on the other side of that, those ca the capacitors hiding behind it were the others that were going bad on that board. So the other ones were good. All the other ones, I've still got them here. And that's the old capacitors. But let's go ahead now and reassemble our EVM and make sure that everything works fine. Another thing to note on this e-board is this thing gets extremely hot when it's running. Now, don't worry, that is normal, but you need to be aware of that. That particular board will be get, I mean, that heat sink gets really, really hot back there. So just slide it in, connect the cable, and then turn the Phillips head screw on the top and the bottom. Now, those screws do not come all the way out. They just go in and up to tighten. And this one, this buff board, along with the other input video cards and the ISR, ISR board, all screw in like manually by hand, or you can use a flathead screwdriver on them if they get stuck. The power board is very easy to slide into at the end. If you go in that sequence and you put the uh, deflection board in first, 
and then the buff board, and then the G board, if you put it back in in that sequence, you'll definitely have the easiest time of getting them all back in there. But everything worked out perfectly. I mean, uh, the monitor works great. And again, the best part of all this is just being able to find out which capacitors are failing and uh, kind of the rate they are failing at and hopefully get it figured out so that in the future we could just avoid really being wasteful and changing capacitors that we don't need to change because they'll still have um, 50,000 hours worth of life on them. And, the way, and then the, the, we need to change the important ones because those ones will wear out faster. And uh, you could literally have a situation specifically with these boards where on that E board and on the PA board, you have caps that are degrading at five times the rate of 90% of the caps. So the bad five or six caps on those two boards degrade way faster than 90% of the caps. They don't degrade and they will last over 100,000 hours most likely. That's it for today, folks. Have a good one. I'll see you next time.